local. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the latest session in CADIS COVID-19 webinar series. I'm Kelly Farah. I'm a research information specialist at CADIF. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that I'm speaking to you today from Ottawa, Ontario, Canada, which is on the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabeg people. I thank all the generations of people who have taken care of this land for thousands of years. Recently, I've been reflecting on the death of Do Joyce Eshaquan, an Indigenous woman who experienced racism from healthcare workers in a hospital just before she died. It makes me think of how the legacy of colonialism manifests itself in our healthcare system and about what I can do to help eliminate this systemic racism. I encourage everyone participating today to think about the land where you live and work and about the people who have been stewards of that land, as well as how we can work together to make healthcare facilities safe spaces for Indigenous people. October is Canadian Library Month. All month long, libraries and library partners across Canada are raising awareness of the valuable role that libraries play in Canadians' lives. Librarians, or information specialists as we call ourselves at CADETH, are an essential part of health technology assessment. And health technology assessment is an essential component of a high performing healthcare system. CADIS Information Specialist team is pleased to present today's webinar as part of our celebration of Canadian Library Month. The topic of today's session is open science, COVID-19 and beyond. During this pandemic, we've seen shifts in the landscape of scientific publishing. In many ways, things have become more open. Publishers have made research related to COVID-19 freely available. Preprint servers have surged in popularity to freely share new results ahead of formal publication. Journals have expedited their publication processes and international collaborations have formed to compile the large volume of information being produced. This webinar will explore these changes in scholarly communications and talk about the implications they have for access to scientific research and for evidence synthesis. Is the open science model here to stay? What are the consequences of bypassing or accelerating the peer review process? And how can information specialists and researchers best search for information on COVID-19 given the speed of new research and changing publication models? We have two highly accomplished librarians with us today as speakers, and they're gonna walk us through the available evidence and help us to answer these questions. Our speakers today are Leslie Weir, who is the Librarian Archivist of Canada. She's the first woman to ever hold this position. She's also the chair of the Open Science Roadmap Advisory Committee and is one of the founders of Scholars Portal. We also have with us today, Dr. Margaret Sampson, who is the manager of library services at CHEO, the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario. Dr. Sampson has authored over 80 peer review publications and in 2010 was awarded Hospital Librarian of the Year by the Canadian Health Libraries Association. So in today's session, each speaker will present for about 20 minutes. Then we'll move on to a question and answer period following both of their presentations. You can submit your questions at any time by clicking on the Q&A tab in the Zoom control bar. Please let me know if you want me to direct your question to a specific speaker. You can also use the Q&A tab to let us know about any technical issues you have and Kenneth Vent's team will try to resolve them for you. So I'd like to call on now Leslie Weir to share her thoughts on how she sees scholarly publishing changing as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic and what these changes might mean for the future of open science in Canada. Over to you, Leslie. Thank you, Kelly. I'm very excited to be here with you today and to celebrate the contributions that uh, libraries make uh, to open science and in fact, during the COVID pandemic. Uh, let's just start perhaps by uh, defining open science, just to be sure that we're all working in the same uh, field. And uh, of course, open science differs from open access because open science includes not only publications, but data, research samples and software. And so we would see it as a framework within which we uh, approach the questions around open methodology, open source, open data, 
open access, open peer review, and open educational resources. Next slide, please. So in Canada, as the, the Canadian participants will know, we have a chief science advisor of Canada, uh, Mona Nemmer, uh, who comes from uh, a research background. And uh, she, in fact, began the discussions with the federal Canadian, with the federal government of Canada around questions on open science. Next slide, please. So why open science? Um, this is a question that's often raised uh, both by researchers, by publishers, and um, by those attempting to use the research. So it is looking at um, trying to ensure that scientific research outputs can provide accountability to those that are funding the research that's done. Open science can also enable the scientific community to, evaluate, to evaluate whether in fact scientific results can be reproduced. Open and accessible science can foster a public dialogue and understanding around the public confidence in science. It can also serve to reduce or minimize duplication of efforts and a more, create a more efficient and effective use of research investments. As well, open science can, and we're seeing this during the COVID period, accelerate the discovery of process by allowing others to build on validated discoveries and research contributions and create to those opportunities around innovation and prosperity. Open science can also create opportunities to benefit from the diversity of knowledge systems and perspectives and can also uh, reduce delays in the sharing and reuse of scientific information. As well, governments around the world are looking at open science and Canada has created an opportunity for it to be part of this movement to help shape the global vision of open science. Next slide, please. So in the Canadian federal government context, there are a number of initiatives that have taken place in the years leading up to today. And they started with a directive on open government, which was made in October of 19, oh, sorry, 19, <laughs> 2014. Um, that was followed by our granting agencies that work together uh, under the uh, title of the Tri Agency, who created an open access policy on publications in March 2015, and then their statement of principles on digital data management, which came out in December of 2016. Now, there was also a model policy on scientific integrity for Canada, which Mona Nemur led, which came out in August of 2018. And the federal government developed a data strategy roadmap in August of 2019. So this created a backdrop uh, for the reason that um, the Chief Science Advisor of Canada decided that it was time to look at developing a roadmap. Next slide, please. So there was an open science roadmap advisory committee, which was struck by Mona Nemmer, and that was struck in the spring of 2019. Um, I was at the time on sabbatical from uh, my university, the University of, of Ottawa, where uh, I had been the university librarian. And uh, Mona approached me and asked if I would help her facilitate the, con the uh, consultations and conversations around the possible development of an open science roadmap. So we created a um, advisory committee and uh, you can see the members listed here. We looked at trying to ensure that we had scientists and we had the technology enablers um, at the table. So we had the Chief Technology Officer of Canada. We had the Science Advisor for the Canadian Space Agency. 
We had an assistant deputy minister for science and technology for Environment Canada, who is now actually at Health Canada and is leading um, our battle, parts of our battle against COVID in terms of the coordination for um, Health Canada. We also had the chief scientist from Natural Resources Canada, and we had the assistant chief statistician from Statistics Canada. And lastly, um, in terms of the federal government representation, we had the departmental science advisor and chief science officer for the National uh, Research Council. Now I should clarify that now open science is sometimes called open research because of course it's not focused only on what some might call the pure sciences or the STEM fields. It in fact covers all research um, that is done. Next slide, please. So we wanted to be sure that if the federal government was designing a roadmap for its scientific output, that in fact, it would be um, coordinated with the developments that had already been done in the research and academic communities across Canada, who had been looking at this over a, a much longer period of time than the federal government. So we brought in additional members to help advise that came from um, universities from, um, and from our, our granting councils to be able to um, provide that background and support in terms of coordinating the approach. We debated and discussed all the issues around open science, and I'm sure they're the same issues that each of you are discussing and debating uh, in your community, perhaps sometimes quite heatedly. Um, we looked at the fact that this needed to be researcher led. Um, it, we needed to ensure that um, uh, researchers would control where they publish, that they would retain their intellectual property where appropriate, that um, there would be incentives to encourage its adoption, and that if things like embargoes were required, that that would be worked into um, the environment. And of course, being part of the federal government, um, we looked at the impact on national security. Um, next slide, please. So on uh, February 26th, 2019, nearly weeks before the uh, uh, WHO um, announced the uh, pandemic of COVID-19, um, the roadmap for open science uh, for Canada was uh, launched, it was announced. And um, in, the, in, in this actual document, the um, definition that we use for, for open science is the practice of making scientific inputs, outputs, and processes freely available to all with minimal restrictions. Scientific research outputs include peer reviewed science articles and publications, science and research data, public contribution to and dialogue about science. Open science is enabled by people, technology and infrastructure, and it is practiced in full respect of privacy, security, ethical considerations and appropriate intellectual property protection. Next slide, please. So we have these five guiding principles that are part of the Open Science Roadmap for Canada, where we really focus on the importance that people play in this role. And that includes all stakeholders, of course, starting with the researchers and then looking at um, right through to the citizens of, of, of Canada and the world. Um, the importance of transparency, that ideally outputs of science should be open by design and by default and that they should, when you're talking about uh, data, be fair, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. We also looked at inclusiveness as a value, a guiding principle, that in fact, they should reflect, open science should reflect the breadth of perspectives across scientific communities and all knowledge systems. And that uh, collaboration um, is a great enabler for open science. And lastly, that open science needs to be sustainable and that it is critical that there are the investments required to support 
um, the principles of open science. Next slide, please. So in the open science roadmap for Canada, there actually are 10 recommendations that uh, with the first recommendation being that Canada should adopt an open science approach to federally funded scientific and research outputs. There are a whole series, as you know, from the fact that there are 10 recommendations, and these touch on a wide range of um, approaches that would be used to implement open science in a federally funded environment. So mandated are consultations with the science community in all government departments, that departments each develop an action plan that's based on those consultations, that the goal um, to make federal science articles openly accessible, ideally in a pre-COVID world, would have been attained, uh, would be attained in January, 2022, that they would, we would develop strategy and tools to adopt the fair data principles, that we would develop a framework um, that would look at the criteria when that would be appropriate for restricting access to federal scientific research outputs, because that can be warranted that we would look at a close alignment between the gov federal government of Canada data strategy roadmap and the open science um, roadmap, that this, there would be a steering committee created to ensure that these um, action plans that were developed are harmonized and that would an, there would be an open science um, strategy beyond federal government departments to look at federally funded research and that the chief science advisor would monitor the situation nationally and internationally and make recommendations on future directions. Next slide, please. So the next uh, steps, just days before the pandemic was announced, um, there was an initial meeting of um, uh, members that would uh, be part of the development of a, an open science steering committee and that included uh, the co-chairs of uh, the chief science advisor and the president of Shared Services Canada, and then a representative from a senior representative from Treasury Board and a senior representative from Libraries and Archives Canada. Next slide, please. So I'm just gonna touch very briefly um, on the uh, time that I have left on um, some of the other related initiatives that are in place in Canada, which bring us up to uh, today. And just to highlight um, the commitment and the, and the support that um, the federal government has um, demonstrated through the uh, digital research infrastructure strategy that they announced in the federal budget in 2018. Now this committed $572.5 million to ensure that Canadian researchers have the digital tools and that they need to support their scientific um, excellence. Um, there is a, a, a series of investments, uh, including into the infrastructure, um, the high-speed network in Canada, and looking at the need to develop highly qualified personnel who can uh, support um, uh, the researchers in Canada and to look at um, uh, a federal funding layer for a data research infrastructure um, that would work in close collaboration uh, with the provinces and with the institutions that have responsibility uh, for um, managing, maintaining and uh, supporting the digital research infrastructure on behalf of researchers. Next slide, please. I just wanna give you a quick snapshot of, of what the landscape looked like at the time. Um, there were a lot of players in the field in terms of libraries represented by the Canadian Association of Research Libraries. There was the Canadian Foundation, Canada Foundation for Innovation and Compute Canada that uh, supports um, innovative research and advanced research uh, infrastructure. There was Research Data Canada, and there was of course Canary uh, who provides um, the high-speed network. Um, and all of these players were each um, looking at how they could contribute, and in fact, how they might lead in terms of the process. And sometimes I think um, 
it was felt there were maybe too many players in the field without sort of a clear strategy to move forward. Next slide, please. So with the uh, digital uh, research infrastructure, the federal government created a more coordinated approach, um, which involves all of the institutions that were previously uh, supporting and advocating uh, in this area, um, but in a much more coordinated approach. Um, so there is the digital network uh, for research and education, and then there's a new organization that's been created to oversee data management research software and the advanced research computing. Next sli slide, please. And this is the website of uh, the organization that was created, um, which is the new digital research infrastructure organization called Endrio. And um, this group is playing a major, major important coordination role that brings together um, Canada's um, uh, academic researchers together with uh, funders, infrastructure supporters, um, and um, the supports provided uh, by librarians uh, in Canada as well. Next slide, please. So um, this is the Canadian Association of Research uh, Libraries, um, and it's their announcement in terms of the agreement uh, where $2.85 million uh, was assigned to support um, the programs uh, that are part of the academic library community, which are called Portage, and work, that work closely with research data management uh, in Canada. And they, you can see that they're uh, partnering here with Endrio. Next slide, please. So the Portage Network, and, and what's the role that libraries are, are really playing um, in this area? Well, libraries are really focusing on ensuring that there is a research uh, data culture in Canada and that there's a community of practice that supports that culture and that there are services and infrastructure to support the researchers in doing their work. And so um, the, the uh, uh, portfolio of, um, uh, of products that are, are, are in place um, through Portage are a federated, a federated research data repository. So moving away from the more traditional institutional repositories um, into um, a, a national federated approach that includes disciplinary and encompasses the institutional repositories. Um, Developing supports for research data management plans that are now required by the granting agencies to support researchers in being able to develop those. The uh, Scholars Portal Dataverse, uh, which has become a national infrastructure to provide researchers with a place to actually deposit their data should they wish to. Training resources to help uh, ensure that we have um, that those highly qualified individuals and then um, Zenodo, the community to, to create that, that community of practice um, to support um, researchers. So next slide, please. So what I've really done is just given you a bit of context um, leading into um, the start of COVID-19. And um, I think we have all seen that the research community has really stepped up since the beginning of COVID. Not that they weren't present before, but they, de they definitely looked at how they can be more responsive, more proactive, and to help lead us um, through this pandemic and to what's going to happen beyond. And so at this moment in time, I would like to uh, turn the podium over to Margaret Sampson, my colleague uh, from CHEO, and she's gonna really take us into some of the things that have actually been happening um, in the research community uh, since the beginning of COVID. So over to you, Margaret. Thank you. And, uh, and I'd like to thank Caddis for uh, giving me the opportunity to, to come and talk today and share some of my experiences with open science, particularly during the pandemic. Uh, slide, please. There's the disclosure. And during the pandemic, I've been working as a clinical librarian in a pediatric hospital, and also as a volunteer member of the Librarian Reserve Corps. 
And my comments reflect my experience and observations in those contexts, um, not any deep expertise that I have in any of these topics. Slide, please. So Leslie gave a good framework. These are some of the bits that uh, I will touch on. Um, so open access at several, open science and open access at several levels, access to articles, to metadata, to original data. Um, but I want to start by laying out a timeline with some milestones. And early December 2019, I first heard of a concerning virus in the Wuhan district in China. By March break, we were being advised that any travel could pose a health risk and we might face quarantine on return. March 11th, WHO declares a pandemic. On March 13th, the NIH National Library of Medicine put out an appeal to publishers to make material related to COVID open access. And 50 publishers responded, many releasing articles within a week of the call. By mid-March, uh, WHO, CDC, National Library of Medicine were providing comprehensive open access databases of COVID related articles. March 15th, the first email went out to volunteers who had answered a call on the Medical Library Association listserv. Um, for, and those were the volunteers um, to join the emerging librarian reserve corps. March 23rd, we started working on systematic reviews of PPE decontamination at CHEO, the hospital where I work. Now, some of the challenges uh, that we were facing by the end of March, information related challenges, were that libraries had closed. Um, access to the collections and interlibrary loans became more difficult. We were dealing with a really rapid pace of publication and preprints. It was difficult for pandemic responders to stay on top of developments. And for systematic reviewers, this meant weekly rather than annual search updates. And we all had to learn the techniques of living systematic reviews. Um, in all this rush, redundancy became an issue very early on. Many people working on the same challenges at the same time, resulting in multiple overlapping systematic reviews on the most pressing topics. Slide, please. Um, I'll talk a little bit about my experiences doing systematic reviews in the time of COVID-19. So with Dr. Dare McNally's lab at CHEO, I've been involved in four systematic reviews on methods to decontaminate PPE, namely N95 masks and medical masks. And we're conducting one living systematic review to keep all of these up to date. Each of the four reviews was done rapidly, but as a full systematic review with no shortcuts whatsoever. Each had a protocol that we registered with Prospero and made public as a preprint on open science framework. Each had full peer reviewed, a full peer reviewed search. Each used a crowd to screen, to gather the articles, to do quality assessment and data extraction. And most of the reviews involved multiple meta-analyses. All were placed as preprints as soon as they were finished, and all four of those are now published. As I say, we're maintaining with one living systematic review covering them all. So a challenge with these systematic reviews was that we were not reviewing COVID-19 publications. All were decontamination studies published before the pandemic. So they weren't, the material we were trying to find and review was not open access. So we had two library technicians as well as a host of research assistants and graduate students whose own research had been shut down, all were helping look for articles as well as the other aspects of the review. As well, of course, we were working from home by this time, couldn't meet face to face, and we're accessing all the library subscriptions through proxy servers. Where most systematic reviews take six months to a year to complete and maybe another six months to publish, that, that was not an option for us. The mass decontamination reviews were commissioned by CHEO, our hospital, which was running out of N95 masks and was having extreme difficulty securing new supplies. And they turned to us for some help. And we, were, we completed each of those reviews in a week. I was then involved in two pediatric reviews. A little different story here. Neither of these has been published to date. We looked at pediatric mortality and morbidity in COVID-19 and COVID-19 in pregnancy and infancy. 
Again, these are based on registered protocols and the first pass was completed really quickly. Gathering articles was no problem this time. They were for the most part open access and that went really quickly. But other challenges included the need to update the searches frequently. And two aspects to this. First involved updating the search strategies as new terms emerged and as new sources emerged. And the second involved rerunning the searches to identify the newly released papers. Other challenges was that a lot of the a lot of the sources we were searching were unfamiliar and sometimes had limited functionality. As well, in these topics, we had to keep adjusting to carve out a unique system and a unique space as we learned of other systematic reviews on the same or similar topics. So data sources for these reviews were a mix, including the standard subscription databases, Medline, Embase, Global Health, uh, plus open access sources. So the WHO COVID-19 database, disaster lit, preprint archives such as MedArchive and Open Science Framework, and finally Google Scholar. So the open access free sources proved challenging because there was often no way to do complex Boolean searches. There were no bulk downloads in some cases, no entry dates, and, and they were generally missing features that, that we rely on to speed up the work. So I've got up here on the slide a, a really good paper um, that looks a, at a lot of these challenges. Uh, Andrea Trico is the lead author, Jesse McGowan and Leah Bulos are the information specialists. And the, that paper is well worth reading. Slide please. So Dr. Gabriel Rada of Epistemonicos recently noted 53 reviews, for instance, dealing with effectiveness of hydroxychloroquine. Um, duplication of effort yeah, in resulting in research waste has been a huge issue throughout the pandemic. As well as waste, I think it leads to public confusion when reviews conducted at different times um, and therefore including different evidence come to conflicting conclusions, particularly on, uh, potentially undermining public confidence. I think this has been an issue we're seeing often. Traditionally, open protocol registration is the route to avoid overlapping reviews. And Prospero, the systematic review protocol registry, did give prior priority to reviewing and posting COVID-19 protocols. There was still some delay there. So we did register our reviews with Prospero, but we posted the full protocols on preprint servers to get them out there. And we also publicized them on social media to help spread the word. Now I have up there the logo for COVID End, which is evidence network to support decision making. And this is an international consortium of 50 organizations, most of whom are involved in systematic reviews. So this forum is encouraging coordination of efforts to reduce that duplication and has identified over 100 priority topics where there are gaps in knowledge. And it looks like a likely solution is going to have ex be to have experienced teams taking on living evidence reviews in coordinated fashion. Uh, slide, please. So the scarcity of primary studies is an issue as, as well as the duplication of effort. So the SOULS COVID-19 database has more than 125,000 unique COVID-19 publications. Of the ones they've classified, only about 28% present primary data. The others are rapid reviews, other evidence syntheses, commentaries, guidelines, those sorts of things. Um, Epistemonicos is a very interesting database that includes systematic reviews and all their primary studies. And the primary studies are linked to all the syntheses in which they're included. Uh, they, Epistemonicos has a special segment for COVID-19 material. Now, when I was exploring its capabilities, I noticed that one primary study might be included in 100 or more reviews. So here's an example up on the screen, type two diabetes as a major risk factor for COVID-19 severity. So this systematic review includes seven primary studies. All but one of those studies involve 150 or fewer patients, so relatively small. Each of those seven primary studies has been included in between, somewhere between 33 and 208 systematic reviews. So 
that's a lot of systematic reviews based on a relatively small pool of patients. And suggest to me that a better way may, to, may be to work with de-identified open data on those patients themselves. Slide, please. So I want to go into preprints. And I think a, a big thing that is going to come out of this pandemic, the, maybe the biggest change in uh, open science is going to be the acceptance of preprints, and particularly in the health sciences. They're a really fast way to make findings available. Um, last week, John Inglis, who's the co-founder of BioArchive and MedArchive, said that 95% of publications on SARS were published after the SARS pandemic was over. In this pandemic, Inglis claims that MedArchive is the single biggest source of articles on COVID-19. And I believe that based on my work. So preprints have some of the following advantages. First, of course, allow, they allow fast transmission. Even with journals giving priority to articles relevant to the pandemic response, the publication lag is still a matter of weeks. Second, there's no cost to post preprints and no charge to access them. Even articles that are available to readers through open access have article processing charges that can be a significant barrier for authors. And finally, preprints are discoverable. Preprint servers can be searched directly or through federated search engines. And there's one available through Sutton Hall. Uh, they can be found through Google Scholar and they're included in Europe PubMed Central. Now the principal disadvantage of preprints is that they're not yet peer-reviewed. However, we've seen some high profile retractions of journal articles during this pandemic and peer review is an imperfect process at best. In systematic reviews, we do quality assessment um, and really preprints are part of the gray literature and we know how to deal with that. Other practical challenges about the preprint service have become apparent though, and a coalition of COVID-19 database curators have identified the most pressing limitations as the inability to identify primary studies. Second, the inability to screen for broad study type, that is interventional studies or observational studies. And this is because there's no indexing. And the third issue is often an inability to do bulk downloads of the metadata so we can easily manipulate that with citation managers or systematic review software. Now, another important factor is not all preprints will go on to be published, but le at least there's a lasting record in the public domain of that work, no file drawer problem. Early in the pandemic, we wrote and submitted an article on pediatric morbidity and mortality. And that was based on the data available at that time. We posted it on a preprint server and we submitted to a journal. We did get a relatively speedy peer review, but the article was rejected. And that wasn't for any quality issues, but because the reviewer felt it was just too early in the game to publish and that more, da more data should accumulate. And we elected not to update and resubmit right away. The lead author has been monitoring the emerging literature and believes that our report is still accurate. Um, and it's discoverable. We got a letter a little while ago from Europe PubMed Central, which reads in part, the full text of your preprint, COVID-19 infection in children, blah, 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 will be searchable alongside peer-reviewed articles in Europe PMC, and I like this bit, freely avail available for programmatic text mining. Uh, so to date, our preprint has been viewed over 4,000 times. So definitely um, been out there and, and had some, some visibility. So it turns out that Europe PubMed Central has been including abstracts of preprints since 2018 and has over 150,000 biomedical preprint abstracts along with the journal published literature. In May, the WHO's chief scientist made this statement. I welcome the huge increase in the use of preprints by researchers to rapidly share the emerging evidence from many studies on COVID-19. However, these are published as PDF documents, and I recognize that the information they contain could be more rapidly searched and linkages made between the results and data they contain if they were converted to the standard publishing language XML. I therefore support this initiative by Europe 
PubMed Central to take on this task. So there are hints here that we're moving towards more open data, interoperability, computability, all those, those helpful things. Uh, slide, please. So another aspect of the open science ecosystem is, is open data. Um, and data deposit allows others to examine, verify, reanalyze, potentially reuse data. And there's been an important role in libraries uh, in data management for, for repositories. However, under pandemic conditions, the data is really needed as close to real time as possible, not as retrospective deposit. And there are some efforts to make de-identified data available. So one is the US National COVID Cohort Collaborative N3C Data Enclave. Now it isn't completely open, but parties can contribute clinical data or request to use it for research purposes. So a data sharing platform. Um, I, I want to mention uh, uh, citizen science as an innovative response. And this can be anything from crowdsourcing systematic review work or other work uh, to a study that I've put here on the slides of COVID-19 long haulers, in which a collective of COVID-19 long haulers design and conduct survey research on, on their own patient collective. Slide, please. And more issues and initiatives I could talk about, but I've been given a time, uh, set time to do that and th then we'll have discussion. So I hope this has given you some flavor uh, for some aspects of open science that I have experienced in COVID-19. Over to you, Kelly. Thanks. Thank you so much, Margaret. And thank you, Leslie, uh, for sharing your, your experience and work with us. We have about 15 minutes now for questions. A reminder to everyone to please submit your questions using the Q&A tab in the control bar. I think we'll start things off with a question for Leslie. Um, we hear that uh, it's great to hear that there's more coordination um, being put in place for open science. The emphasis in the new Canadian structure seems to be on data management. Uh, how is access to knowledge being addressed? COVID has shown how much false information is out there internationally as well as in Canada and access to evidence-based information and knowledge has proven most difficult. Um, Leslie, can you speak to how, um, how we can move towards open knowledge and combat misinformation? Well, that's a complex question. And in fact, something that is always on the minds of, of librarians uh, and information professionals, um, because I, we've seen a large rise uh, over the past 10 years in terms of what might be called false news, uh, you know, um, uh, um, and, and incorrect information. Um, what I would say is that the emphasis is not just placed on, on um, uh, data uh, in this um, open science approach. It is much more in terms of the information that's available and making sure that that information is discoverable. Because one of the challenges is that um, you need to be able to um, verify that the information that you're using has some validity or some credibility. And that, of course, is a, a major uh, task that librarians work with in terms of supporting um, both in our, in our um, uh, academic and research and corporate hospitals, but also in our public libraries and school libraries, that in fact, we, we develop a, a, a country of critical thinkers because one does have to be able to evaluate uh, the information that one is using to support your decision making. And so what I would say is that open science is trying to make a range of information available. And Margaret, I think, has highlighted uh, some of the impact in terms of things like preprints um, and that it creates an opportunity for you to bring these different sources of information together to help validate your thinking and to help create those critical thinkers. So I would say that open science is one tool in um, a number in our, in our um, toolbox that we need to use to help people to search out um, information and try to validate it 
so that it can help them develop that, that knowledge. And of course, going further um, to wisdom. Great, thanks. Thanks so much, Leslie. Um, Margaret, maybe I could direct um, sort of a similar follow-up question uh, for, for you. Um, the pandemic has seen a lot of distrust in science. Um, does the open science help to build a public trust in science or, or does it confound the public trust? Well, um, we do, we, I mean, public trust is, is key in this pandemic um, to public trust to observe um, the precautions set out by our, our public health officers, uh, public trust to be accepting, receptive to vaccines that, that will hopefully quell a pandemic. Um, Catherine O'Brien, the WHO director responsible for vaccines has said, Science has been called on the carpet at a time when trust is needed as never before. Y yes, there's been a lot of distrust expressed. And so open science is maybe a, a double-edged sword in that regard. One of the goals is transparency, um, that it is open to public scrutiny, uh, scrutiny by other scientists, uh, but it does expose the way that science actually works. And uh, another little quote, this is from Ed Young from The Atlantic, um, I think last week, and, and I heard this in another webinar, uh, that science is a, a slow, erratic stumble towards ever less uncertainty. And uncertainty is extremely stressful for people in a pandemic. Um, so, you know, this is, this is normal, the normal scientific process, um, but it isn't pretty. And, you know, public health officers have, have changed their position, changed their direction as more becomes known. Um, so I hope that one aspect of open science that emerges from the pandemic is a more comfortable relationship between scientists, journalists, the general public, um, and, and there are groups working on this. WHO has sort of an infodemic um, task force going to, to look at some of these questions because they're, they're absolutely critical. Well, thanks, Margaret. And there's no easy answers. No easy answer, no. no. All right, um, moving on, a question for you, Leslie. Um, so someone writes, for statistical analysis and simulation modeling, open science would require publishing both input data and software. But in some cases, input data uh, are confidential, um, or they may also be derived variables which require some documentation. Um, uh, in your open science framework, uh, have you thought about these cases and do you have guidelines uh, for what to do in those situations? Um, yes, uh, that, that, that has been a, a key area of, of conversation, just trying to ensure that um, privacy, confidentiality, anonymity um, can in fact be maintained. And um, this has long um, been a, a challenge because there are a number of disciplines that have uh, uh, for decades um, chosen to, to share uh, data that they have gathered. And it's very important that everything we do fits within a scientific integrity. Um, and so there need to be um, criteria and um, part of the framework needs to support researchers in making these decisions. And um, I think we, we also know that um, some data won't be shareable some data will need to be anonymized and shared in, in a way that does not risk um, contravening uh, appropriate practice around privacy. Um, and um, other data may in fact um, uh, um, be able to be uh, shared, but perhaps not openly, not uh, completely openly. It may be just shared um, within the scientific community between researchers where there's agreement um, from, from the subjects involved. So it's a complex situation. Uh, and the whole question of software, because if there's proprietary software involved, um, how can one actually make um, uh, the data available? And uh, there certainly is a move that software is part of open science where we need more open source software that, with, that can support um, 
the sharing of these kinds of data. Um, but it's, 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 it's an evolution, right? It's, it's a development over time. As we learn more, as um, the technical infrastructures become more sophisticated, if we have a goal of sharing data, then we'll look at developing methodologies that'll help us in doing that. Um, and if we're assuming that our data is closed, then it's harder to plan after the fact to share. It's easier to have designed one's approach with an awareness that one will be planning to share that data. Oh, great, thank you, Leslie. Um, a question for, for both of you, I'd like to hear both your comments on. Do you think that the progress made during the pandemic in terms of open science will be sustained uh, post-pandemic or will researchers revert to, to normal practice? Um, and I guess for Leslie, what's the role of federal government um, in, in making the shift to more, more open science practices? Um, so maybe we'll start, start with you, Margaret. Sure, thank you. Um, our, so the efforts that have been going on probably are not sustainable. People are getting tired. They've been going hard at this for six months now. Um, it, and an issue is that the, well, we're seeing emerging issues. So the scope is broadening. So now questions, what are the effectiveness of social and economic responses? Um, I've heard the phrase, everything is COVID-19 now. And so sustaining those specialized databases, um, the willingness of publishers to continue to offer open access to COVID-19 articles as a bigger and bigger percent of the emerging literature becomes that, I don't know. Uh, we'll see as the scope becomes broader. Um, I think, uh, I think some change will definitely be sustained because we've seen the benefits of it. Really, this has been a fantastic chance for open science to show its stuff. Uh, I think open science is what has enabled the, the high level collaborations we're seeing between groups that are, are streamlining things, getting rid of those inefficiencies and the redundancies I've spoken about. Um, and, and that's been hugely important in the response. Um, it's, it's been just a great showcase for open science. So while some of the specific things will change, um, I think that, that really open science has proven itself and there's no going back. Okay, thank you, Margaret. And Leslie, from your perspective, um, I know the, the pandemic sort of hit right when your, your roadmap to open science um, was kicking off. What do you, what, what do you see changing um, based on what's happened during the pandemic? And do you think uh, these changes will be long lasting? Well, I, I remember when the pandemic first started, some of the conversations uh, actually in, in the federal government around workplace and just how we function, um, people were saying, oh, you know, it's probably only gonna last uh, two or three months. And um, they say change, if you actually want like longer term change, um, you know, you need to be in a sustained um, sort of change environment for over six months. Guess what? We've passed the six month mark. Um, and, and there's probably quite a bit more ahead of us. Um, like what Margaret was saying, we certainly hear about saturation. People are feeling they're just, they're just like, uh, they have focused and concentrated and put such an effort over such an extended time that it's not uh, a pace that can be maintained. But at the same time, I think that um, researchers and clinicians and the public and the public health people and the librarians um, have all created new networks. They've created new conversations they are uh, looking and had to look at working in different ways. And I think it's only after the fact that we'll really see what of those changes are sustained and continue and which ones drop off. And I would suggest probably the majority of change will uh, uh, disappear and people will go back to the way, I mean, if we look at the 1917 pandemic that lasted for more than 30 months, um, think what followed that, the roaring 20s. Um, so, you know, people who sort of discuss 
the impact on society, um, it's unknown um, where a post-pandemic world will take us. But I would suggest that there was already momentum around open access and open science and sharing of um, research outputs and the ability to be able to reproduce, the, be able, the ability to be able to reuse. And I actually think that that'll be a sustained, there'll be sustained momentum for that. Um, and interestingly enough, just to, to go back to your uh, previous question um, to Margaret, um, there's been public polling that's been done, um, which has actually shown that there's a fairly high confidence level, even with the evolving messages from public health. And I would suggest pre-pandemic, there's probably no Canadian that could name the, chief, the, um, the public health officer in each province and territory, but I'm, I'm willing to bet a dozen donuts that in fact, um, your average Canadian probably could name the majority of them today. Um, and uh, so I, I think we're gonna find a sustained understanding of the importance of science and research to society and um, that hopefully this will give open science some, some, some momentum. Okay. Thanks. Thanks so much, Leslie. And that's an optimistic note to end on. And we're almost out of time now. Um, so we have to wrap up the question period. Before we go, uh, very quickly, I'd just like to get um, give you both an opportunity for just one last word. So Leslie, um, very briefly, if, if you, there's one thing you want people to remember out of the webinar, uh, what would that be? that open science needs to be research led and it's got to be something that benefits uh, science and research at large and that all of those people on this webinar are part of those communities and that they can help us realize the positive impacts that open science can have on society. Right. And, and Margaret, for you, same, same question. What's your key takeaway message? Um, I think open science can really accelerate research. It sets a tone and a foundation for collaborating on critical issues as, as we've seen so strongly in COVID. Uh, and I think there's a, a huge role for librarians in this. And the thing I've really learned from this is preprints are a thing. <laughs> Well, thank you so much to our two speakers today, Leslie and Margaret, and for everyone who tuned in. I'd also like to give a shout out to Canada's librarians and our libraries and all the people who work in them. Uh, when you leave the webinar, uh, there'll be a new window for a, with an evaluation survey. Please take a moment to fill it out. This webinar will be posted to CADIS YouTube page later this week. And I invite everyone to join us November 9th and 10th for the 2020 virtual CADIS Symposium. Until next time, remember to wash your hands, wear a mask, and stay safe. Thanks, everyone.